Hello out there. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another welcome, welcome, welcome to another live stream here from Autocrit. I am Daniel, your writing coach and your instructor, a little bit of the face of Autocrit here. If you're not familiar with Autocrit, we are a primary source for authors to get involved in their work in all different sorts of ways. We have our fully functional writing desk, which is an online uh, platform which allows you to uh, plan and edit and write and create your book. We also have a online community with all kinds of fun community events, including uh, we just recently had our March Madness Challenge. I'm going to discuss that in just a moment. And uh, we also have our academy where we have all kinds of learning opportunities so you can become the best writer you can be, similar to this live stream. Now today, <clears throat> excuse me, my I gotta clear my throat. Today, we're going to be discussing writing advice that you should know, and maybe some writing, ad writing advice that you probably uh, should avoid. Yes, I'm doing my little my little microphone today. Hello there. Just trying to up my sound a little bit. Um, hopefully, it sounds a little bit better. We're going to continue to work on uh, the technical side over here. This was very sweet there, Paige, waiting to be astounded. I certainly hope I can astound you. Uh, I, I stand on the shoulders of giants, as as they say. Um, I do a lot of research, so um, <laughs> the writing advice, particularly today, uh, does not uh, originate with me. It's uh, things that I've heard over the years and things that I recommend to others. Uh, we have people from all over. I'm just looking at the comments here. Some people wonder, it's like, why are you looking off to the side? That's where my chat is. <laughs> um, and we have people from all over the country. So welcome, welcome, welcome. But I don't want to waste any time. I want to get right into this writing advice. Um, some of the things that we should know, you know, you can find advice almost anywhere. And, um, uh, you can find advice almost anywhere, and uh, you uh, should and find advice uh, in many places because there are there are people that have in fact done this before us, right? And they have some great ideas on the best way to handle it. Somebody was saying that I didn't have any ears because I'm straight on. Yeah, I can turn to the side though, and you can see them. Um, yeah, it just it just cuts me off when I'm 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 forward. <laughs> You're waiting for me to break out into song. Well, I have written three musicals, but I will uh, with um, I will refrain at this time. <laughs> Always astounded by Dan. Oh, you're so sweet. I love you guys. You're so wonderful. All right. So anyway, let's talk about the positive first. Let's talk about the writing advice that you should know. Here's one write regularly. We say this all the time in Autocrit. Uh, one of the best things that you can do is you can get into a, a habit and a schedule. The reason why is because systems generally work better than goals, right? Uh, you can have the goal and it's like, I'm going to write a book. Okay, well, what does that mean? Until you have written a book, you're kind of a failure, right? I mean, it sounds horrible, but that's the framing you've chosen, right? When you say, my goal is to write a book and then and that's it, well, it's like you've either done it or you have it. Right. So I generally prefer systems, in which case you say, I am going to decide as a writer, I am going to write whatever, a thousand words today, 500 words today, a thousand words a week, whatever you can manage. Right. And then if you do it on a regular basis, well, what's the outcome? Yeah, you will have a book. But rather than just thinking all the way, you know, skipping all the steps and just thinking of that end, you have compartmentalized it into a system. And the good news is once you go through that system, once you get regular at it, well, you have that productivity that comes out and you can just keep doing more and more works, right? And you want to build up a regular habit um, and then it becomes a little bit addictive in a good way, you know, addictive habits that are positive are great, right? And <laughs> that you want to do. And uh, then uh, you'll find your productivity uh, goes up a lot when you can do that regular. And the other thing too is you want to avoid breaking it. Once you develop a habit, you want to be very careful, even vacations and things like that, of breaking that habit. Not that you should never take days off or things like that. I certainly believe that should be part of your system, of course, work-life balance, even in your hobbies. But uh, you want to be careful because when you get off the horse, as it were, it's hard to get back on. I'm going to, I say, I'm always going to write a scene, whatever length it is. Yeah. A lot of people do that. 
uh, that kind of thing. They figure out a way to piecemeal it out. And then you can feel that you are um, successful, right? And again, it's not the, am I done state or not? In which case you're going to beat yourself up a lot. It's, oh, look at me. I'm doing a lot. Okay. Um, but speaking of beating up, beat up your characters. Yes, this is common advice. Um, rather than take it nicely to them, uh, do not be afraid to get a little rough. Uh, sometimes uh, artists will be nervous about doing this because they're like, well, doesn't it reflect badly on me if I really put people through the ringer? Uh, isn't that a little dark, et cetera, et cetera. But it's through adversity that we build strength. And it's through adversity that we see the character's strength. So do not be afraid to put their back against the wall. Really go for it. Now, it will vary from work to work. If you're, you know, writing middle grade, you're you're probably not going to have as brutal of a book as if you're writing, you know, like uh, grim, dark, or horror or something like that. However, uh, just make sure that you are pushing things where they need to go. Do not hold back because you like your characters too much. Unfortunately, they do need to suffer. It's just how it goes. Part of life is suffering, and part of drama is suffering. All right, eat a lot kind of obvious. But yes, uh, sometimes we can get into a writing mode and we neglect to read. There's a couple of reasons why this is not great. For one, uh, you do kind of run out of the well. You know, you, you have like that reservoir of ideas, partly from listening to others or just what's floating around in your head. And you, you kind of get spent a little bit. Uh, that can happen. The other problem is that specifically if you're trying to write to a market, if you're trying to become a published author or create your own career, uh, you don't want to fall out of line of all the trends going on currently, right? Writing does evolve. You know, um, writing in 2023, the average, you know, pick any genre, right? But the average romance novel in 2023 does not look like the average romance novel of 1923, right? And that didn't just happen overnight. That was a progressive period of time where it shifted from one to the other. And so what you don't want to do is you don't want to be like 20 years behind because those are the classics that you read. You do want to read a lot. And uh, particularly if you're writing the market, you want to read what is selling now. You know, what's doing well now, because that's what people are interested right this moment. And what that might do is free up your imagination. You might see devices that modern artists are using that you didn't think about, uh, different styles, different word choice, et cetera, et cetera. Suffering is mandatory. Enjoying it is optional. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's fairly true. Uh, reading a new romance right now and every character is suffering, but so is the reader. Oh, no. Um, well, yes. Um, that's the other thing, too, <clears throat> is to be frank, uh, reading something can motivate you to do it better. Um, I mean, that happens. You read it and you're like, wow, this was a great premise. Too bad the artist did a terrible job. Uh, even if it's popular, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't think about that. Right now, you can you should realize <clears throat> that means you're not completely the audience for it because they did find an audience and they were successful. So have that humility. But on the other hand, no, you don't have to like it just because everybody else likes it. And you could say, well, I would do it a completely different way. And you probably you might find an audience uh, who would follow you and enjoy that as well because uh, they wouldn't like the book either. And this gets to writing for yourself. Yes, um, generally speaking, uh, even though people recommend paying attention to industry trends, paying attention to the market, it's not about just being so insulated that you're just writing a book that the only person that would like is yourself. But what I mean is think of yourself as your first biggest fan, the, the person that you're really writing for. You're part of that audience too. When you get super cynical and you're like, well, nobody really likes what I like, I'm going to have to like sell out as it were and do what everybody else is doing that often doesn't end up in a work that is that great your heart is just not into it you do need to care about what it is you're doing and uh, this is also something to keep in mind as you get into the weeds of your project keep in mind what attracted you to the project in the first place and we've talked about different ideas of how to do that, have like lookbooks, you know, in the autocrit writing desk, you can do those little note cards and you can create a little look board for yourself. And you can remember all the wonderful things that made you excited about the world building or the characters or things like that. 
but uh, you don't want to lose that. And you do want to have that. You can usually tell when somebody is cynically just writing because they're, you know, they think that's what's going to make them money or what's going to make them an audience versus what they really care about. And uh, it does it does show in the work. It's a very dangerous thing to do. All right. Uh, write what you know. Is this a good piece of writing advice or a bad piece of writing advice? Um, I'm going to say this is actually a transition from good pieces of writing advice to potentially not so great. And the reason why <laughs> is um, I am not a fan of write what you know because that doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, I understand what they mean. What they mean is you should ground yourself in your life experience, ground yourself in the things that you're comfortable talking about. Uh, again, it's kind of like what we were just saying. You don't want to try to tackle something that your heart is not really into it. But on the other hand, I mean, if you're a fantasy writer and you're writing about an agricultural-based society that is matriarchal set on the island of Crete and you've never been to Crete in your life, can you do that? Sure, right? Does it take a little bit more effort? Yeah, you're going to have to do research. You're going to have to figure out a lot of things. But if you're passionate about it, then that's fine. You know, I believe, like Stephen King, uh, people can write about anything as long as it's the truth, which means they, you know, authentically believe in what they're talking about. So in that sense, yes, write what you know. But on the other hand, of course, this is all fiction and uh, you can empathize with all different sorts of cultures or backgrounds there's there's just a lot of opportunity for you and of course uh you can bring in sensitivity readers other people involved uh to make sure that it reflect you know reflects well to them if it resonates with them as well <laughs> i know depression and anxiety <laughs> Yes. And if you're like, well, that's all I, you know, I hope I know that's not all, you know, but if you're like, well, that you don't necessarily therefore need to make all of your protagonists, people that suffer from depression and anxiety right now, that could mean if you speak to that, you would be good at it from the first hand experience, but no, maybe you would actually want to kind of uh, escape from that a little bit and and get into some, you know, and empathize with somebody else. Maybe somebody who doesn't have that problem. Maybe somebody who's a real go-getter, get them person who, you know, that's not something they struggle with. Nothing wrong with that, right? Why not? It's, you know, a lot sometimes, depending on the genre, what you are writing is wish fulfillment, right? So there's nothing wrong with that. It's, you know, it's entertainment. Uh, never outline. This is a piece of, of, of writing advice you'll hear, and you might be surprised to say, I don't agree with it. No, I am an outliner. Now, a lot of people don't outline, and that's fine. If you are what's called a pantser, or I kind of prefer George R. R. Martin's term, which he calls them gardeners, and you kind of write as you go, and you don't really plan in advance, that's not bad. There's nothing inherently evil of that or it's not wrong um but sometimes you get people that think that if you do outline you're always going to paint yourself into a corner you're always going to be formulaic and this is simply not true there are a lot of great writers that outline a lot like down to you know the smallest minute detail uh the great you know from a movie standpoint the great director alfred hitchcock like he was so planned out that the actual filming of his movies was almost anticlimactic because he storyboarded and he planned it all out he had very interesting artistic work so there is nothing to say that planning in advance is going to rob yourself of spontaneity or creativity because it's still spontaneous and creative as you're outlining now i will say i like to joke around about this where i say nobody avoids outlining it's just pantsers have an outline that's eighty thousand words long <laughs> and essentially that's true right i mean you're never going to avoid that process where you figure out what the story is it's just either you're doing it as you're kind of putting the meat on the bones or you start with the bones but either way it's a valid way of doing things do not panic if you are somebody who never outlines that's fine but if you are somebody who outlines don't worry that you are going to you know paint yourself into a corner now, it is possible to do that, but it's also possible to be as formulaic and bland by pantsing, too, you know, because you just get writer's block and you run out of ideas. It happens either way. Edit as you go. That way, your first draft is nice and clean by the time you're done. No, I've heard this advice and I don't like it. Now, if this is your process and it works for you productivity wise, you're you might be an outlier because mostly this does not work well. 
and the problem is is that when people are trying to edit as they're writing, they tend to get in the weeds. They tend to not produce very much. They tend to not finish. Uh, it, it it's just a different headspace for a lot of people. There's this headspace that's this fun. Woohoo! We can do anything. Let's go, go, go. And generally, you want to stay in that headspace if you can. When you start getting into the editing headspace, it's like, yeah, but is this any good? And you don't want to be in that headspace when you're trying to just get it out there, right? You want to go back to that headspace when you're doing your second draft, your third drafts, your rewrites, your polishes, all of that. But when you're just trying to find, you know, kind of spit it out, it's often not helpful. It slows you down. Uh, it can make you have so much doubt that you are worried about it. But again, there are some people, so I'm not going to say rigidly never do this. However, uh, it is not a general good, it's not a generally smart piece of advice. I have seen it, but I just don't like it. I don't think it works well. And just from my clients, you know, all the all the community members I've talked to, I, I just don't think it works well for the vast majority of people. Here's a question. How do you jump back into your book after an editor has overwhelmed you with questions and their ideas? That's a good um it's a good point. This is something where editors should be careful with this. And what you might have to do if your editor isn't savvy enough to be cautious on how they suggest things is, uh, excuse me, you might have to prioritize it yourself. Now, we had our self-editing workshop we just did. We'll have another one in the future. But um, we've also done some live streams about it called After the Draft. But that gives you kind of our standard process we recommend for people when they're polishing and rewriting their book. And uh, you could use the editor comments on top of that. But you, um, I would say tackle that in some sort of process, like put it into a process if the editor hasn't, because yes, otherwise you're just going to be overwhelmed. So if they're like, your characters are not, you know, this character isn't very strong, or this is a plot hole, or you have a tendency to write too long of sentences, or whatever, just take them one step at a time. You know, don't try to do it all at once. Don't don't like try to read a chapter and do all the editor things at the same time. I would say focus on one of the points. You know, it's like you have too long of sentences, go through the whole book. And then that that generally works better for most people. Although here's another example, one chapter at a time. Right. So all all advice does come with some stipulations, <laughs> some, you know, I'm just talking about in general. All right, here's a piece of advice I don't particularly like. Don't be formulaic. Why? Why can't you be formulaic? It depends on what you mean, right? Um, I like I like in writing formulas to things like recipes. The only way that you know how to bake a cake or any sort of baked good is if you understand the formula of what's going to make it rise. If you don't, it's going to be flat. It's not going to have the right consistency or the texture. That has nothing to do with creativity, right? Um, every, you know, or the scales. Let's go with another analogy, right? The scales in music. Learning the scales does not affect your creativity or your output. In fact, it only helps you because you understand the principles. You understand uh, how you know, what you're doing instead of it just being instinctual. Now, is there anything wrong with somebody who's just kind of figured it out? No, but I think some people who have just figured it out really get on to people who have this systematic process that explains how it is they make an effective story as if they're glued to some sort of horrible, rigid scheme. And that's not really true. All they're doing is putting words to what the other person is doing. Um, now, there is such a thing as a formula that is too rigid, right? If it's like, well, people only like stories that are, and there's like 20 different stipulations to like the main character and you feel like you can't vary from that. Sure, but I would say most formulas that I see out there are not really that rigid. Even the classic hero's journey, if you take in the more ab abstract sense, which is really how it was intended to be given, because it was trying to come up with like the mono myth, you know, the centralized myth behind everything. It wasn't intended to say that every story would hit every mark exactly, you know, on the nose. Even that as a formula is something that can give you a ton of different stories right? All over the place. So no, I, I don't actually think formulas are that bad. And yes, some genres really do have some expectations that you deviate from at your own expense. 
um, quite disastrously so, depending on the genre. The romance genre is, in many ways, notoriously the most formulaic because it has to end in the happily ever after. It has to end in the happily or happily for now. The people do have to meet really quickly. Like there's a lot of expectations. But on the other hand, there's still a lot of variance within all those expectations. Same thing as music artists that say someone is sold out. Usually it comes from people who are not successful. It's right, right. Yeah, some people are like, eh, you know, all their stuff is the same. It's like, well, I don't know. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Sometimes breaking the formula is so much of a disappointment, it ain't soul experience. That's right. When people get really hot and bothered and they're like, well, I'm not going to do what everybody else is doing. And it's like, again, looking at, um, you know, people who bake, it's like, well, sure, you don't have to like make your uh, cake batter the same way as everybody else in terms of what makes it rise. But good luck. Is it going to work? <laughs> you know, I, there's multiple methods to make it rise. And so maybe, yes, you'll come up with a newfangled version nobody's ever seen before. But first of all, is it worth that effort to just be original? And second of all, is it going to actually work? You know, exactly. Uh, never start sentences with conjunctions. This is a very specific one. Uh, but yes, you'll get these sort of things. And I'm saying this as an example of this sort of grammar rule. Grammar is not ever, grammar has never really been standardized in the, in the United States for English. Um, let's be honest. It has varied over the years. It will continue to vary over the years. Um, things like texting changes it, um, the way conversation has gone has changed it. You know, it's it's not an exact science. There's reasons why you might want to write in a rhetorical style uh, based on dialect, based on conversation style, based on so many things. So be very careful. If you're somebody that your writing style is that kind of conversational style, and then you get an editor and they're like, how dare you? It's like, well, they're just not your audience, right? Move on find somebody else. Uh, language does evolve. That is correct. <laughs> and why shouldn't we? Yes, exactly. Um, now, there is a piece of advice, which is true to this, which is when you break a grammar rule, which, you know, you think of what's a grammar rule, let's say a standard grammar expectation in 2023 based on common usage. Okay. Uh, when you break that, yes, you, you, you are standing out. Now, I would say currently in books, starting a sentence with a conjunction is totally normal. You're not really breaking any rule at all. It's part of the rhetorical style of books these days or the, the writing style, however you want to put it. Um, it is quite normal. So no, it's not going to stand out. On the other hand, uh, there are other literary devices you might use that would stand out. So, you know, you might want to think it through on that. Don't share your work with anybody until you're done. How dare you? It's going to ruin everything. Yeah, um, this is a piece of writing advice I don't necessarily say you have to follow. Some people, this is true. You don't want to do it. Now, um, the reason why for some people this doesn't work well is because they're going to either be too affected by the other person's reaction because they'll be like, I don't know. Did you like that chapter as much as the last one? Did you? Did you? What about this? What about, you know, and if you're doing that, no, that's probably not going to help you. Um, the other person's reaction is going to unreasonably muddy your story. Again, you run into the risk of concern because the other person is obviously not as excited about your project as you are most of the time. And so the fact that they're not as hot and bothered about your chapter 16 as they were chapter two when they were new to it doesn't necessarily mean the book is ruined, you know. You can, you can end up really hurting yourself reading too much into it, or you can end up where the other person tries to write your story for you. And that's bad too when they're like, well, I really wish you would have gone this direction. And then you have doubts and you're like, well, I don't know. I guess I could have gone that direction. Hmm, maybe I should have. So that is a reason not to. However, there is the cheerleader approach where you're sharing with somebody and their job is really to do nothing else but to be excited about what comes next and just keep you motivated. And that's positive. And there are people who, in fact, don't mind pushback as they go because it isn't going to completely derail them. It kind of depends on how confident you are in your own ideas. If you're somebody who's really confident about your own ideas, then the other person 
might, let's say you're doing a twist on a classic trope, right? And so you're doing that twist and, and the other person's like, I don't know, this, this doesn't seem right. And you're like, oh, just wait. I, I know what I'm doing because it seems a little weird right now, but I'm totally setting it up for something better later. Well, I mean, go ahead and write it. You might be aware that some audience members would think that way, but yeah, you could do it and then you could see the reaction later on. Exactly. Uh, don't share with family members. That's usually bad advice. Uh, that's usually uh, bad advice to share with family members or most people don't say to do that. I do agree with that. Um, but it depends. I know people who share with their spouse and their spouse's job is just to say, you're awesome. Fantastic. Keep up the good work. And it works just fine for them. It kind of depends on whether or not your spouse is a good critic or not. Some people are married to people who are just as interested in literature as they are. Some people could kind of give or take it. You know, they might support their spouse and their hobby, um, but, um, you know, or their significant other or best friend or whatever. Um, but they might uh, support them, but they really don't care much about it. But they'll be willing to read it just to be like, oh, that was interesting. And that's all you need. <laughs> so it, it just depends. If they're a good critic, I would say no, I would wait. Wait until the end because then you're getting an actual evaluation from a good critic uh, when it's in a better spot. Because why would you want to put your best foot forward when um, – why would you want to not put your best foot forward for a good critic? That's kind of my thought. Um, but often your family members, the issue is not that they're a great critic. It's that they're kind of indifferent and they're not as interested in it as you are. That's just the odds are, in which case that can really mess you up because you can be like, well, I don't know. Is it any good? And they really weren't your audience in the first place. Now, what this can do is uh, maybe help you with just kind of on a broad sense how exciting the premise is or something like that. That's not necessarily a bad thing to market test, especially if you're you're debating a few ideas and you're like, you know, I could write a story like this or I could write a story about this. What, what would you prefer? You know, and granted, if they're not exactly your audience, it's kind of a weird market test to do. But on the other hand, it does tell you kind of what's that strange attractor to somebody. Uh, Stephen King's wife was his beta reader for years, but as far as I know, he did not share anything with her until it was done. However, um, not done, done, but at least first draft. But however, she is the reason why Carrie existed because he threw out, uh, he wrote the scene, um, where, uh, Carrie has her first period and all the, the people are taunting her in the shower. And, um, and he was like, I don't know, this is kind of weird. I don't know what to do with this. And he threw it away. And his wife picked up. She's like, no, 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 there's something really to this, right? Um, and Carrie was his big breakout hit. So <laughs> in a sense, um, it was good that he did share his work. And this is where it can be helpful. You know, again, that strange attractor sort of thing. I think at the very early stage, it can be helpful because – if you remember in the back of your head, oh, there was somebody who said this was a really cool idea at the core, that can help motivate you through. But the meticulous level, I do think it's better to wait on that. All right. I think I ever counted that story correctly. Um, yeah, Carrie, Steve, I, I, that's, I believe how we recounted it in on writing. <laughs> it's been a while since I've read that book. Um, all right. What about show? Don't tell. Is this a good piece of advice or a bad piece of advice? It's kind of both. <laughs> uh, the reason why is because I think in its current framing, it's a little bit difficult to understand. Um, I often prefer to say demonstrate, don't simplify or dramatize, don't summarize. And that's because show don't tell is a little bit confusing. However, show don't tell is really one of those things that um, you have to uh, spend some time parsing out. It is a confusing piece of advice. And this is correct. Screenwriting. Do you know where this piece of advice came from? It came from screenwriting. And if you didn't know that, well, that means you've never taken my showing versus telling workshop. Look at that segue. So, yes, coming up in a few weeks, uh, I will be doing a showing versus telling workshop, which is going to go into greater detail about the specific piece of advice because it's a hairy one to parse out. You really have to go into the details. However, when you do master it, it's a wonderfully good piece of advice. Wonderfully good. That is not well written in my head. I'm sorry. Agree. It took me years to figure out what that even meant. Agreed. 
And now that I have, I can share it with all of you. So if you would like to join me for the Showing versus Telling workshop, uh, you can go ahead and sign up for that. I do not have the link here. Hold on just a second. I got to load that up. My apologies. It will begin uh, April 13th at, uh, and uh, it will also have a, um, we, we do it twice. It's the same session each time. So you have two different times, uh, Thursday, April 13th at 1 PM and Sunday, April 16th at 7 PM. We try to cover a, a few different time zones with our times. And if you want to sign up, uh, it is right there. Yes, the showing versus telling workshop. And I will go ahead and throw it in the chat. It's volume. Uh, this is on one of the comments. It's volume. If you showed everything, it would be many thousands of pages longer. Correct. It is not a piece of advice you always have to follow. It's a sometimes advice. And that's one of the reasons why it's a little bit tricky. And one reason why we have to really go into the nitty gritty details, examples, et cetera, et cetera, in order to, <clears throat> in order to uh, get the most out of it, for sure. I'm in. Great. Awesome. I hope to see you there. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Um, all right. So while uh, you're looking at that link, I have a little update from our community, which was our March writing madness. Isn't that exciting? Demonstrate. Don't pontificate. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> um, ooh, and you finished your book three. A beta reader said she cried to say goodbye to the characters. Uh, that's awesome. That's really awesome. I love that. That's like my favorite review I ever got was like the person is like, I felt like they were my friends. And I'm like, oh, it's touching, you know, because when your character your characters almost become like your kids in a way. And it's like, oh, you love my kids. You think I have a beautiful baby. It's not nice. Um, but we had a March writing madness challenge. And what it was, was we put everybody in brackets. We had them do little challenges throughout March and we narrowed it down to our final two. And the final two were given the first sentence and the same first sentence and the same last sentence and told to write us a short little story. So I thought it would be fun to share these little stories and then reveal the grand winner of March Writing Madness. All right. So here is the first story and it's cutting off a little bit. So let me move over. It might be a little bit hard to read, but don't worry. I will read it for you. And let me get rid of that banner at the bottom as well so you can read the bottom. As the clock struck midnight, she found herself standing alone in front of the abandoned carnival with a mysterious key in her hand. She pocketed it for her collection. Had to hurry. If she was late to this tea party, she could lose her head. Recent rain had left the asphalt path path with a slimy coating of mud. Tin sides of trailers were decorated with ripple patterns of rust like blots of blood. Artistic, if you were of a mood, she was not. Their party was seated beneath a white tent that was turning green with mildew. Pigeons slept in the rigging above, their guano co coating the ground so thick the sisterhood was laying out blankets to sit in picnic fashion. It stank like a swamp. Next year, she was choosing the venue. She sat with a group of sisters who all wore outlandish hats. If she knew them from last year, she didn't remember. That was normal for her. Memories were slippery fish. She drank oolong, ate sandwiches filled with a raw meat she couldn't name, and debated the relevancy of bonnets until the speaker ascended to the stage. Ascended the stage. A fine lady with rings on her fingers, bells on her toes, and soliform music wherever she goes. A few stragglers hurried to finish their conversations before the speaker began. As she sipped her tea, the woman with the bright red hat turned to her and said, Beware the pigeons, for they carry secrets that even the winds cannot whisper. And yes, um, those were the opening and closing lines I gave them. Weren't those fun? Um, Fantastic. All right. Let's look at the next one and then I will reveal the grand winner. I'm curious. This is story A and this is story B. And again, um, I do know who won. We had a poll already, um, but I'm curious who here in the chat uh, would have picked. 
I want to know if our live audience would go. It was a very close vote. So I'm curious. <laughs> it's almost like a tie. <laughs> All right. As the clock struck midnight, she found herself standing alone in front of the abandoned carnival with a mysterious key in her hand. Growing up, the school, school children shared tales of kids disappearing from the park, stolen by the coven of Columba Livia for sacrifice in carnival macabre's uh, macabre tunnels. I can I can read. The only words Ivy deciphered on the worn page in her dead grandmother's journal, Carney, Maka, beware the pidge, and a key taped to the other side. The gate unlocked without incident. The decrepit map pointed her toward the passageway. Moving through the solemn darkness, the glow of her phone flashlight illuminated etchings of birds scratched into the clay walls. She arrived at a barren space with only a stone table at the center. Carvings of pigeons on top of small humans pecking at their eyes adorned the border. A horrified gasp escaped her mouth. Brown stains permeated the rounded edges. I may imagine the terror this platform witnessed. She rushed out of the tunnel. The legends were true. The coven disappeared after the carnival closed. Grandmother. Morning came. At the local coffee shop, Ivy found a bench outside to sit and gather her thoughts. Sensing eyes on her and glancing over her shoulder, she saw a flock of pigeons on the ground and a woman behind her. As she sipped her tea, the woman with the bright red hat turned to her and said, Beware the pigeons, for they carry secrets that even the winds cannot whisper. All right. Columbia uh, Livia is the scientific name for pigeon. Nice. I love those kind of nerdy references. Great job. Um, so I'm curious. Uh, this is story B in the chat. Quickly, who do you think won the March Madness Challenge? I know it's very close. I'm glad I didn't have to pick. I'll just say that because they're very different, but both quite compelling. So, yeah, go ahead in the chat. Tell me. Who do you think won? Because I would really love to know. And uh, it was Sharon and Tony who were our, fin fin our finalists. So congratulations to them. Very exciting. Oh, wow. It's... Uh... It's 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 quite mixed, but it does seem like it is somewhat skewing for B. And in fact, uh, B is the winner. So uh, Tony was the grand winner or is the grand winner of the March Madness Challenge. So if you're out there, congratulations to you. And uh, you will be receiving a message uh, to claim your prize. Um you will get a, a free complimentary uh, trip to either our uh, Showing versus Telling workshop or to our um, uh, a Tony with an I. Not, not Tony King, but Tony with an I. Um, you will get a complimentary trip to our Showing versus Telling or um, you can come to our new short story course which we're not quite ready to announce all the details about. Check out next week. We'll talk about that. But we will, we do have a new short, short story course coming, uh, which is going to feature me and uh, works from uh, Rain Hall. We probably have met, met, seen Rain Hall in the past. And uh, a lot of comments from her. She's a great st short story author. So, yeah, we're going to be uh, doing that next month. So congratulations to you. Uh, you can pick your winner you could pick your prize for that oh this is a good one i almost thought about including this fantastic uh did i cover dialogue and the advice that it is wise to start an argument uh, between two people um <clears throat> i don't generally like any sort of piece of advice that's like start your novel like this unless it's you know start with conflict that's true, right? You want to get to conflict as soon as possible. But conflict doesn't have to involve two people. It can be somebody is looking for their car keys. Somebody is angry that a crow is really noisy outside. You know, um, just something to be something that's causing a stir that's making characters do action is a great way of starting. So you definitely want to do that. 
Um, but do you need to actually like start with a conversation? I mean, no, not necessarily. Um, it can work, but I wouldn't say that's like a good piece of advice or a bad piece of advice. It's just a method to start your story for sure. Ooh, is there a short story contest this spring? Perhaps. Perhaps there is, in fact. Um, <laughs> all right. So tonight um, we have Fantasy Club, and I am very jealous of Mr. Greenbeard. Nobody's ever commented on that. I just think that's amazing. I need to like show up to Fantasy Club like that one day. Um, but um, we tonight are going to discuss large casts. And no, not the kind that you get when you injure your foot, but when you have a lot of people in your story. And how do you juggle that? And tomorrow, Horror Club, uh, you are going to, uh, it's going to feature Gareth, and he is going to discuss body horror. Of course, we always have our accountability club on Mondays at 11 a.m. And all of these clubs are part of Autocrit Pro membership. So if you aren't a pro member, well, become a pro member. You get access to all of these clubs. You get access to special learning opportunities. And you get access to the full, fully functional writing desk. So there are some reports, actually the majority of them, that are only available to pro members. But if you want to try it out, you can go on and you can create a free account. Or we do offer a 50% off discount for the first month. So it makes it just $15 for the first month. It's really awesome. You can go on in there and uh, yeah, check out what Autocrit is all about. In the meantime, uh, thank you so much for joining me. If you have anything that you would like to see on this channel, please comment below, like, and subscribe to this channel for more writing advice. We'll continue to provide writing advice on this channel out to YouTube for free. Compliments of Autocrit because we're awesome like that. But yeah, comment below if there's anything you'd specifically like to see. And I will see you around the community. Thank you so much, everybody. And have a great holiday season for those of you celebrating over the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, maybe you're just celebrating being out of school. That's fantastic too. Uh, bye, everybody.